people who have been through grade school, high school, and even clear up through college still do not know how to spell happiness? Well, some people spell it. Some people spell it money. spell it being popular. <laughs> but that's how you spell happiness. J stands for Jesus. for yourself. You have to put Jesus first, others second, and yourself last. You'll be happy. Well, that was a few years ago, wasn't it, Christina? When was that? I was 11 years old, and that was my very first uh, presentation I'd ever done up front. I was uh, teaching a family Sabbath school. A family Sabbath school about joy and how Jesus gives us joy. Well, actually, that's the funny part. The, the story was about feed, Jesus feeding the 5,000. Oh. And I, somehow um, I had seen that acronym about joy in my school assignment one day, and it just really stuck out to me, and I just was excited to be able to share it. So I convinced my mom that it would be the perfect introduction to the story of feeding the 5,000. She was not convinced, but she let me do the introduction anyway. Well, I'm so glad that you could come out with me so many years later now and uh, share a little bit more about how Jesus helps us to find joy. I'm anxious to hear what you have to say today. Why don't we pray together and then let's go out here in the woods and hear what the Bible says to us. Father in heaven, thank you, Lord, for this beautiful place. Thank you, Lord, for your word and the joy that you give to us. I pray, Lord, that as we open your word today, as we journey through the woods, that you will teach us what it means to have joy. We thank you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, I'm excited to see what the woods is, has for us today. Let's go find out. All right, let's go. And God's got some amazing stuff for us, too. Amen. Joy to the world, the Lord is come. Let earth receive her king. Let every heart prepare him room, and heaven and nature sing. You know, we sing these words so often. We say them. We put joy to the world on our decorations on the wall. We hang it on the Christmas tree. But do we really know what it means? Joy to the world. Joy. What joy? What joy to the world are we even referring to? I'd like to take us back to God's word in the book of Luke chapter two, where we find the Christmas story. And right after Jesus was born, we see angels looking, 
looking for someone to spread the news that the Savior was born. And they looked everywhere. And they thought they weren't going to find anybody looking for the Savior's birth until they finally found a small group of shepherds out sitting around the campfire, repeating the prophecies, claiming the promises, praying for the Redeemer. And they were the ones to hear the good news. Suddenly, the light, the sky, it just filled with glorious light. There was no more night visible anywhere. It was bright as day. And it says in Luke chapter 2, verse 9, Behold, an angel of the Lord stood before them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were greatly afraid. Then the angel said to them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. What good tidings of great joy? What was this joy that the angel wanted to share with the shepherds? He says, For there is born to you this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. A Savior. Joy. Joy filled the hearts of the shepherds. The Savior had come. The Messiah was born. Oh, they were so excited. But the angel had to warn them. He says, This will be a sign to you. You will find the babe wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly hosts praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace, goodwill toward men. Joy, joy to the world. What was this? Joy to the world? Joy to the world that we have a Savior, that Jesus Christ is born. joy. So why is the tidings of a Savior bringing so much joy to the shepherds? It didn't seem to bring joy to a lot of other people. The shepherds ran in uh, to Bethlehem. And they found the Savior. They fell at his feet. They worshiped him. And I can just imagine them like in their excitement going from door to door, from house to house, Remember, the town was full right now for the census. Mary and Joseph couldn't even find room because all the town was full. All those people, the shepherds were just going from place to place saying, we have found the Messiah. The Messiah is born. He's here. He's in the stable. He's in a manger. He's wrapped in grave clothes. And you can just, you know, picture the people of Bethlehem saying, now wait, wait, wait a second. Have you not understood that the Messiah is to come as a king? Isn't he here to break the ties of the Romans? Why? Why would he be in a stable? Why would he be in a manger? Why would he be in a bed of dirty straw wrapped in grave cloths? I mean, seriously, you guys, you shepherds, you're just out of your minds. And so the shepherds themselves were the only ones filled with joy. Of course, as we know from later on in our story, the wise men were filled with joy at the tidings. And they come to Jerusalem. And they come to King Herod. And they ask, where is the king of the Jews that is born? And everybody in Jerusalem is like, who, what, what? Wait, that king was born? And Herod's like, no, uh, excuse me, I'm the king. Like, 
Uh, if there was a king was born, he'd be my heir, you know, like, no, 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 no king's born. And even when the priests and rulers read to King Herod about Bethlehem, Ephrata, though thou be little amongst the thousands of Judah, yet out of thee shall come forth unto thee that is to be ruler in Israel, whose going forth have been from of old, from everlasting, Micah 5.2. Even when the priests and rulers read that verse to the king, the only one who believes is the king, and somehow it doesn't bring him any joy. So how was this tidings of joy? Well, it was obviously joy to the wise men as they went along unaccompanied by anybody else from Jerusalem to Bethlehem, and they find him with his parents in a quiet little humble home in Bethlehem. They worship him, they bring him the costliest gifts, and the next thing we know, Joseph and Mary have to flee for their lives to Egypt for threat of death. Joy. Why? Why was there such little joy? What was the reason the angels were so excited? What was the reason the shepherds were so excited? Why were the wise men so excited? It's because of one simple thing. We find it in Matthew chapter 1, verse 20 through 23. And this is talking about Joseph when he first finds out, backing up in our story, when he first finds out Mary is pregnant and not by him. And he's trying to decide if he should put her away privately. An angel comes to him and says, Joseph, do not be afraid to take Mary, your wife, for what is conceived in her is of the Holy Ghost. She shall bring forth a son and you shall call his name Jesus. Why? For he shall save his people from their sins. Joy? Absolutely. Savior from sin. It continues on, verse 22. All this was done that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by the Lord through the prophet Isaiah, saying, Behold, a virgin shall be with child and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which being interpreted is God with us. The Savior, God himself, came as a baby to save us from our sins. Why was there not that much joy at Jesus' birth? Why was everybody else indifferent? because they didn't recognize their need of a savior. Why would a savior bring you joy unless you knew you were dying? Why would a savior bring you joy unless you knew you were a sinner? What were they looking for? They weren't looking for a savior from sin. They were looking for material worth. They were looking for power. They were looking for deliverance from the Romans. They would be the greatest nation ever. A savior from sin? Who needs that? Who does need that? Do you need a savior from sin? What is our first step in understanding true joy? Is knowing our need of a savior. Jesus wants to save us from our sins. He wants to fill our hearts with joy. And he says, just humble yourself. Understand your need of a savior so that I can save you and fill your heart with joy. Going back to that acronym that fascinated me as a child, Jesus first, others second, yourself last, we're following that as our outline for the sermon today. So if J is Jesus, our Savior, 
finding joy of salvation then others or O would stand for the joy of service the joy of service helping others and most importantly helping others to find Jesus as the way of salvation in Psalm 126 it says those who sow in tears shall reap in joy he who goes forth weeping bearing precious seed shall doubtless come again with rejoicing bringing his sheaves with him but going back further in the chapter we find what happens first before we sow before we share the precious news of salvation with others it says when the lord brought back our captivity we were like those who dream then our mouth was filled with laughter and our tongue with singing then said they among the nations the lord has done great things for them the lord has done great things for us whereof we are glad you know when jesus fills our hearts when we experience the joy of his salvation there's no way we can hold back we have to share it with others because our hearts were filled with so much joy you know it reminds me of a story i read many years ago there was a lady she worked at a post office she was a postmaster and she was known as a grouchy old lady she wasn't very kind i mean she did her work she made sure everybody got their mail and whatever else but she wasn't very nice about it just really sour faced and didn't have really anything nice to say to anyone well one year just before christmas she fell ill and she was in on her sick bed in the hospital over christmas totally oblivious to the days of the week or what happened and when she finally was able to come back to work christmas was long past and over and everyone had just gone on with their lives and she was so sad because christmas was like one of her bright spots in the year and she thought well you know what i know what i'm going to do i'm not going to skip christmas this year i'm just going to celebrate christmas tomorrow I'm not going to tell anyone that I'm celebrating Christmas. I'm just going to celebrate Christmas. And so she made some little candies and uh, bought a few gifts. And that morning she went to work and she had a smile on her face and she greeted everyone kindly. And after work was over, she went started going visiting those who were in need and bringing them gifts and encouragement. And she had so much fun. She said, you know what? no one knew i celebrated christmas yesterday i'm going to celebrate again tomorrow too and so she did the same thing again the next day she went to work she spoke kindly to people she had so much fun she had a beautiful day afterwards she visited the sick those who were in need she gave them gifts and uh, she thought you know what i was saving money for a new coat i'm just going to use all the money that i was saving for a new coat on christmas gifts for these people and then I, uh, well, I'll just wear my coat one more year. It'll be all right. And so that's what she did. And she used up all the money from her coat and uh, took her several days, almost a week, uh, to give out all these gifts. And she had so much fun, but <laughs> then she ran out of money. She didn't have another coat money saved aside. So she thought, well, I'll just make some baked goods for people. And when she ran out of money to buy stuff for baked goods, then she thought, well, I can at least do de deeds of kindness, you know? I can, like, stop by and help someone who's sick or give someone a helping hand or run an errand for somebody or just do kind deeds. And pretty soon she decided, you know what? This is so much fun. She turned into a different person. She was kind. And what was the difference? Her life was the same. She had the same hard life that she'd always had. She still lived alone. She still had plenty of things to be gloomy about, but now her heart was filled with joy because she was focusing on others. Service for others, sharing Jesus' love for others fills our hearts with joy. It takes us off of what problems we're dealing with ourselves 
and focuses it on other people. And when Jesus fills us with his love, <laughs> we can't help but share it with others. And that lady at the end of uh, uh, the year decided, you know what? I'm just going to say Christmas is every single day of the year now because my life is so much happier. I have so much more joy. I just want to keep it going. Going back to our JOY acronym, Jesus first, others second, your self last, or as we have been noting, the joy of salvation, the joy of service, and it comes down to ourself, and that is having a heart of joy. Let's talk about what it's like in the real world. Is it easy to have a heart of joy in all circumstances? <laughs> I mean, sure, yes, we feel joy at the thought of salvation, but what about the real world? The aches and pains, the trials, the frustrations, the, the challenges, the worries, the hard work, the long hours. There's so much that seems to squelch our joy. How can we truly have a heart of joy? You know, <laughs> apparently there were some people in the Bible that dealt with the same thing. Because we have a fair bit of advice about this very topic. Uh, Jesus himself, in the Beatitudes, in the version that we have in the book of Luke, uh, Luke chapter 6, verse 22 and 23. It says, Blessed are you when men hate you, when they exclude you, when they revile you, when they cast out your name as evil for the Son of Man's sake, rejoice in that day and leap for joy. For indeed your reward is great in heaven, for in like manner their fathers did to the prophets. Rejoice and leap for joy when you are persecuted for Jesus' sake. That's a lot to take in, isn't it? But it gets even more. Uh, look at the book of James. James chapter 1, starting at verse 2. He says, My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience. But let patience have its perfect work, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. Count it all joy? Do we really count it all joy? That's a lot to think about, isn't it? You know, sometimes when we think about this acronym, you know, putting Jesus first, others second, yourself last, we tend to think that means we need to punish ourselves, that we need to neglect ourselves and only take care of those around us. You know, Satan is always prone to extremes. He don't care if he gets us one way or the other. But part of counting it all joy is taking care of ourselves. Knowing that we are precious in the sight of God. Realizing our worth and our value in God's eyes. And treating ourselves as God's holy temple. Taking care of ourselves. God says... I want to fill you with joy. You know, when Jesus was talking to the woman at the well, he says that my water of life or my joy will be a well of water springing up into everlasting life that never goes dry. Jesus says, I want you to be filled with my joy. And uh, I love how Jesus himself he says in John chapter 15, verse 11, he says, These things I have spoken to you, that 
my joy might remain in you and that your joy might be full. Jesus says, you don't have to manufacture this joy. This isn't something you have to come up with on your own. He says, my joy, my joy is going to remain in you that your joy might be full. Do you have that joy? Have you experienced the joy of Jesus? Maybe you should ask him today to fill you with his joy. I want to close with a very touching story. There was a, this little town up on the hill many years ago, and it was a sweet little town, a lot of well-to-do people, had nice lives, nice homes, nice shops, beautiful streets. But of course, you know, they had garbage and trash and things that they needed to get rid of. So they chose a valley just below the hill where the town was that they would use as their trash dump. And so they began taking their trash down to this valley. Well, soon those who were too poor to afford the nice houses began to build little shacks down in this valley in the trash heap, using bits of trash to build the homes boxes, crates, whatever they could find, uh, digging through the trash to find broken toys for the kids or uh, discarded things that they used for furniture or whatever. And then they would go up into towns to find a little odd jobs that they could to get by. And so this valley uh, eventually became to be nicknamed Tin Can Valley because of course of the little trash town that was developing around this landfill for the town. The folks up on the hill looked down on the inhabitants of Tin Can Valley. I mean, after all, they were the poor, the lowly, uh, the ones who didn't seem to make it in life. They were looked down on as dirty, lazy. But, you know, they had a little tinge in their heart of you know, pity for them, especially around Christmas time. So they would send down you know, boxes of broken toys or uh, discarded things or secondhand items, which of course was no different than what the inhabitants already pulled out of the trash heap, so it wasn't really anything special. But one day, a young woman came down into Tin Can Valley and she began to talk with the children and share with them and minister to them and make friends with them. And this one little boy, we will name him James. James said to her, ma'am, why, why are you here? Why, like the folks up in the city, up in the town on the hill, they never think anything of us. They never do nice things for us. Why are you here? Why are you uh, talking to us and helping us and bringing us things? And she said, James, the reason I'm here is to tell you a story, a story that you have probably never heard. And so she told James the story of Jesus, the story of the little baby that was born in Bethlehem, in a manger, in a poor family, in a poor surroundings, but came to save us. And oh, that story stuck into little James' mind. Long after that lady left, he went outside in the cold, looked up the stars and said, Oh, it would be so neat if I could see that Christmas star that the wise men saw that day. As he was gazing at the stars, it was very cold and his threadbare coat wasn't keeping him very warm. He had to go back in to warm up inside his little shack. But not too long later, the kind lady came back again. And James was so excited to see her. Oh, all he could think of is he wanted to hear that story one more time. 
And so as she was there, she told him, I am here with a special invitation. I want to invite you over to our little mission for Christmas. We have Christmas gifts, lots of food, a special Christmas program, and you will get to hear the story of Jesus again. And he said, oh, I will be there. I'm so excited. But before you leave, will you please tell me that story one more time? And so she seated herself down and told him the story of Jesus, who was born in Bethlehem in a manger, who came to save us. Oh, he loved that story. He clung to every word. And after she left, he counted the days until he could go and join the mission for Christmas. And Christmas Day arrived. And he was able to go, he and his mother too. And they went and they heard the beautiful Christmas carols. They ate the wonderful food. They opened Christmas gifts. And then he got to hear the Christmas story again. This time the pastor told the story. But he didn't stop with the baby in Bethlehem. He continued. He told about Jesus' life, about the miracles, about how he taught, how he ministered, and ultimately how he was nailed on a cross to die for our sins. Oh, tears just trickled down James' feet and face as he heard that beautiful story of Jesus. Not only who was born, but died on the cross for our sins. Afterwards, he ran up to the minister and tugged on his sleeve and said, Sir, sir, do you think, did Jesus die for me? Did Jesus die to save me? Yes, the minister smiled. Yes, he did. He died just for you. And he wants you to tell that story to others. Me? Really? Me? James couldn't believe his ears. God wants me to share that story with others? Oh, what a joy. He was so excited. He went home that night and he told the entire story over and over and over and over to his mother. He couldn't sleep. He just kept telling her the story from beginning to end about the baby and about Jesus, his life, and how he died to save us until finally her own heart was convicted and she accepted Jesus as her Savior. Well, the next morning dawned with a terrible blizzard. A huge snowstorm was blowing, but James quickly after breakfast got his coat and went outside into the bitter cold. And he was gone most of the day. He came back in at dinner time, and his mother asked him, where have you been? And he said, oh, I have been up into the town. I have been telling others about Jesus. I am so excited. She says, well, did they not know about him? Oh, most of them already knew, but there are others who don't know about him. Do you think, mother, that I should go tell more people tonight? And before she could reply, he grabbed his coat again, that threadbare coat, and went out into the darkness, into the blizzard. He ran up that hill to the town and marched up to the biggest, most beautiful houses and began to knock on door after door after door. And each one, the door would open and someone would come out and say, you know, see him dressed in his rags and look there and think he was some dirty old beggar or something. What do you want? And he would say, have you heard? Have you heard of Jesus? Oh, yes, I've heard about Jesus. And he'd say, okay, then I'm going to go tell somebody else. And he would run off to the next house. And door after door after door he went. It got colder and the snow blew harder, but he didn't care. He was so filled with joy about the Savior who had saved him from sin. And he couldn't wait to tell somebody else. But frustration began to mount in his little heart as person after person after person, this big, beautiful town, had said, oh yeah, I already know the story. And finally, in desperation, he said, well, if you know the story, how come you've never told us before? And then he got to the biggest, most beautiful house in the entire street. And he knocked on the door and a gruff man answered. And he said, sir, have you heard the story of Jesus? And the man said, why, yes, Sonny, I've heard the story of Jesus. Why don't you come inside? You look like you're about ready to get frostbite. You're freezing. It's cold out here. And he said, but sir, why? 
How could you know the story of Jesus and never tell anyone? How come you've never sent anyone to our village to tell us? Why have you not told anyone? And with that, he turned and ran into the snow toward the next house. Well, this gentleman was extremely worried because that little boy looked like he wasn't going to make it much longer. And so he put on his coat and his hat and his boots and he went out into the cold. And he searched and searched until finally he found James crumpled in the snow, unable to walk any further. He picked him up. He carried him inside where it'd be warm. He called the doctor, but it was too late. James didn't make it that night. He gave his life to tell others the joy of the Savior. But James' last words to that man was ringing in his ears, and he realized it's true. Why haven't we done anything? Why haven't we told them? And so he began to organize a group to tell the inhabitants of Tin Can Valley about Jesus. He raised up a church in that valley, and in the boy's honor, an inscription was placed on the pulpit. It says, if you have learned about Jesus, why don't you go tell somebody? So friends, I'm asking you today, if you have experienced the joy of Jesus, if you have experienced the joy of service, if you have experienced his joy in your heart, then why don't you go tell somebody about Jesus. Joy to the world. The Lord has come. And not only has he come as a baby in Bethlehem, not only did he live on this earth to die for our sins, not only did he die on the cross to save us from our sins, but he is coming back again soon to take us home with him. Joy to the world. Let's pray. Our precious Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you that you have promised to fill our hearts with your joy. Father, we recognize that we are sinners, that we are in need of a Savior. We ask that you will save us from our sins, that you will teach us how to find joy and service for others, and most importantly, that you will fill our lives with so much joy that it just spills over to all we come in contact with. Father, as we are here in the Christmas season right now, a time when we think about your birth and what you have done for us, I ask that your joy may be poured out to all around us, in us and through us to others. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.